Welcome back to the channel. I want to talk to you about something that's in the news lately, but it's also an evergreen topic, which is placebo-controlled or randomized controlled trials. When do you want a sugar pill? When do you want an active placebo? When do you want the best available medical therapy? When do you want a sham control? Let's get into placebo controls. I think there are lots of misunderstandings out there, and I hope to clarify all of that in this video where I'm going to go through a lot of different studies from drugs to vaccines and more and explain when we use placebo and when we don't and what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of different control arms in, in clinical studies. So on that note, let's get into it. I want to first start by giving you a broad overview of randomized control trials. There are many different designs in a randomized study. One commonly used design is the experimental arm, you know, the experimental drug plus the best available care versus a placebo plus the best available care where I think many people will think that placebo is an inert placebo, something like a sugar pill or something that's just going to give the appearance of the drug but not contain any of the active ingredients, and that's in combination with best supportive care or best available care uh, or versus the medication with best available care. That's one design. But you can also do randomized control trials, and some drugs have come to market where it's the new drug versus the older drug. In fact, they're not always blinded. Sometimes you know you're getting the new drug and you know you're getting the older drug, or the older drug could be something called investigator's choice. We're going to get into that. And placebo itself is a broad category. What exactly is a placebo? Is it something purely inert, which is, I think, what many people want it to be for some vaccine studies we'll talk about? Is it something that actually is active in some way, i.e., does it contain a bit of other chemical compounds so that the person receiving it doesn't know they're getting the placebo, they don't feel nothing, they feel some side effect. Is that what we want in a study? When And what do you do for a mechanical intervention, a procedure? What kind of control arm do you need for that? So we're going to talk about all these things. We're going to talk some cancer drugs, we're going to talk some cardiology stenting, we're going to talk about vaccines, we're going to talk about it all. And this is one study that I think is an important one to talk about. This is uh, Checkmate 141, do I remember correctly? 141, which is nivolumab versus investigator choice chemotherapy in second line had an squamous cell cancer. And what does that mean? That means these are patients who have metastatic cancer, that's cancer that we can measure, that unfortunately there's nothing we can do to get rid of it all. And they have already completed one line of treatment, so one course of therapy that might have shrunk the tumor for a while, but eventually it stops working, the tumors start growing in the face of that treatment, and then they're getting put on the second therapy. And the standard of care in the second line setting was what is broadly here called investigator choice. Here they restrict it to one of three drugs. That's a whole nother story. You should read some papers that Timothy Olivier and I have done on that. But it's one of those three chemotherapy drugs. That's the control arm, which is what doctors would have given one of these patients outside of the study, arguably, versus nivolumab, the new costly immunotherapy drug from BMS. So for somebody out there who says every time, and this led to drug approval, of course, so if somebody's out there saying that every time a drug is approved, the control arm is an inert placebo, well, that's just incorrect. Because one of the core principles of a randomized control trial is that the control arm should receive the care you would be giving outside of the study. It should be the best available medical care. The question is whether or not by adding on a drug or substituting a drug, as this does, do you get a better outcome? So this is really nivolumab plus all the care that goes into having an oncologist who cares about you versus investigator choice and all that care that goes into that. And it is not a placebo control study in the sense it's not an inert placebo, but it is pretty useful at asking whether or not nivolumab improves overall survival, which it does. So I think there's not anybody I know of in oncology who would say that they think the placebo effect or somehow thinking you got or knowing you got nivolumab would have resulted in more people living longer. The placebo effect is very powerful it can affect all sorts of endpoints like how much pain you feel, how your breathing feels if you have asthma, and as we're going to talk about, even how your chest pain feels when you have chronic stable angina. But I've never seen convincing evidence that the placebo effect can increase the amount of time you live. And so if the question, the primary endpoint of the study, is overall survival, I think it's acceptable not to have placebo control and to have a study design like this, where the control arm is getting arguably the best available therapy. Although... I might quibble and say the investigator choice has omitted some drugs, but that's another story. So you already read the paper that Olivia and I did on that. Okay, but what about side effects? So here actually 
And the top panes show that the outcomes of nivolumab are better in people with pdl one stains that are high and not in people with low. And then they have a whole bunch of quality of life things. And it shows, arguably, that maybe nivolumab is doing a little bit better than standard therapy. But here, a purist might ask themselves, well, how much of the side effects are due to the nivolumab uh, versus like if you had given salt water, and how much of the side effects are just due to not getting the chemotherapy and not having those side effects on board? And so I will concede that this trial does not isolate the side effect profile of nivolumab. It was used for the regulatory approval and marketing authorization of nivolumab in the second line setting of headache squamous cell cancer. That's a mouthful. But it doesn't actually isolate the side effects of nivolumab. Now, of course, there are some clues along the way because you can compare the side effect profile of an immunotherapy drug against the side effect profile of a cytotoxic drug, and you'll see that there's a whole bunch of different side effects because they tend not to have a lot of overlapping toxicity. So you can start to get a sense of what the nivolumab is doing in terms of side effects. But, you know, a purist would concede that you don't know all of the side effects of nivolumab because the control arm was not getting nothing. They were getting something that has different side effects that may obscure to some degree those side effects. We'll talk more about that when we come to vaccines. But the reason this is such a practice-changing study is that it doesn't matter what those side effects are, they are not so significant that they would push away or uh, erode the big overall survival benefit, the fact that they're living longer. The thing you're measuring is such an important endpoint of how people are doing. So yes, it might have some side effects, but you know we know for some confidence you're going to live a lot longer if you get nivolumab. And I should put an asterisk there. This is a lot longer in the context of oncology. I think many people will say that, boy, even that four-month benefit or, you know, three-month benefit that you show, uh, it's just not good enough for our patients. And I'm actually quite sympathetic to that. It's still not good enough. Okay. What about an oncology trial where they do do a placebo control, but this time maybe they're getting it wrong? Okay, this is fruquitinib versus placebo in patients with refractory metastatic colon cancer, the Fresco 2 study. I tweeted about it, which I, I think they're not happy about this tweet. I called it a disgusting, unethical placebo control trial in colon cancer just so fruquitinib can win. Okay, so this was the study that people, you know, would have wanted, you know, these pro-placebo people who I think kind of don't have a great understanding of placebo. This is a novel anti-cancer drug versus a inert drug, sugar pill, I think, although they didn't specify exactly what's in the sugar pill, but I'm pretty sure it's an inert substance. Um, in patients with colon cancer who have received multiple prior therapies, in my opinion, they haven't received all of the therapies one might have wanted to give them, but they received multiple prior therapies. They're randomized to the new drug or sugar pill, and we measure survival. Lo and behold, there is an overall survival benefit. People start patting themselves on the back. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve for overall survival. But the problem with the study is that I think they shouldn't have allowed the control arm to get placebo because you wouldn't have given someone placebo outside of the study. You would have given them one of the anti-cancer drugs they've already gotten in the past. You would have recycled it and given it to them again. In fact, very likely you would have given them the drug they hadn't seen in the longest amount of time. And if you were getting 5-FU, there are different ways to give it. You can give it a bolus or infusional. You could have given it in a different way. And by the way, back in the diggity, before we had oxaliplatin and irino tecan, we would give 5-FU over and over again, bolus, you know, uh, full, modify full plus six, you know, Mayo protocol. We'd give it in different ways and we'd still engender some responses. Okay. So my claim is that it shouldn't have been placebo control because that's beneath the standard of care that you would have received outside of the study. In fact, they'll do worse than what they would have done outside of the study. And one piece of evidence I marshal to prove my case is in the supplementary appendix, where if you look at what people got after their tumor grew 20% or more, resist 1.1 growth, after it grew on placebo and best supportive care, you see they got 5-FU again, they got Zolota, they got Oxaliplatin, they got some irinotecan and some regorafenib. And my point is just this, if they're going to get these drugs after they progress, a few months down the road, after they've had a chance for the cancer to get worse and their health to deteriorate, imagine how much more patients could have gotten these drugs had you given it to them in the beginning and made this a fruquitinib versus investigator choice randomized control trial, which would have been the more ethical option, which would have been not the more ethical, the only ethical option for this study, in my opinion. So this is a 
incorrect use of placebo control. Now, one thing it allows you to do is the safety signal, whatever safety events you know, you know it's all the fruquitinib because you just subtract a sugar pill, an inert substance, you subtract the placebo. So you have a really good grasp of the safety, sure, but by the way, I actually don't know if fruquitinib is anything better than giving those old drugs over again. In fact, it might even be worse, and that's kind of a big screw up if you ask me. So what did I say about this study? I said, the trial should have been fruquitinib versus investigator choice, where the patient lives in the USA and has good insurance coverage. That alone is a fair trial. I come back to my golden rule. What if your mother was on the control arm? That's the golden rule. What if your mother was on the control arm? Would you be comfortable? Everyone who treats colorectal cancer would have pulled their mom off the study given 5-FU and BEV or Irene Otik and Oxali or Fulfox again, perhaps slightly differently. The proof is that they give it post-progression. And then I said, we all know why the investigator signed on to the unethical trial. You get all the glory from having a Lancet paper and you, and if you say no, some, they're going to find someone else. So my point here is just that you keep asking, you know, keep asking for placebo control trials. Sometimes you'll get it and you don't want it. You don't want it here. It's arguably unethical. I delete the arguably. It's just unethical. Okay. Now let's talk about vaccines. I'm going to show you a chart. Um, many of the people who are concerned about vaccine safety point to the fact that in randomized control trials of vaccines, the control arm is not pure salt water. I think this is the point that RFK Jr. makes. It's not pure salt water. It's not just water or something totally inert. Um, it's got the adjuvant in it, the amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate. It's got something else added to it. And this is an example from the package leaflet of Gardasil, where it was a randomized control trial of Gardasil versus the AAHS control and a saline placebo. They actually had a third arm where some people, a few hundred people, got a pure saline placebo. And actually, it does lend credence to the argument that on the issues of safety, having something added to salt water obscures safety a little bit. So just look at pain. Mild to moderate pain post-dose one was experienced by 62% of people who got Gardasil, 56% of people who just got the uh, AAHS control, and only 33% of people who got the saline placebo. So what does that mean? That means that since Gardasil is doing a little bit worse than the AAHS control, that the active, uh, immunologically active part of Gardasil is increasing the pain, sure. But also the control with something in it, with the amorphous aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfite in it, is doing a little bit worse than saline, which actually shows that had you just given nothing or given saline, the pain would have been even less. So. I think this is a point that some people have, which is fair, that if you want to know the short-term acute side effects of a vaccine very, very clearly, your control arm shouldn't be a solution with the amorphous aluminum in it that will just mask some of the side effects. It should be something totally inert, like a saline or water injection. So this is the point they want to make, and I think we have to concede that point is true, with some caveats. Now, some people say that if it had all been a saline controlled study, you would have been able to find the thing that they're very worried about, which is something like a link between the vaccine and perhaps something like autism. The problem with that, and then they say by using the aluminum hydroxyphosphate sulfate as the control arm, you mask the ability to detect an autism signal because the control arm is getting the thing that they're worried about is causing the autism. Perhaps this is the argument that they would make. Now, the problem with that argument is that let's just say everybody here who got a placebo which is something like 3,800 people, all got the saline placebo. Well, now you have a study that's roughly, you know, 5,000 versus, let's say, 4,000 people. We can even make a 5,000 versus 5,000 people. Um, your ability to detect the autism signal, uh, it makes less sense here because this is a vaccine given to people who are a little bit older, but let's say you, you know, you took it to childhood immunization vaccine. You just don't have a lot of power. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. You've got 5,000, 5,000. You just don't have a lot of power for a rare adverse event. Something could be a rare side effect and having a placebo controlled regulatory study, it's not gonna find that. I mean, you need sample sizes in the hundreds of thousands, uh, maybe even the millions to detect really rare and important safety signals. So in my mind, if you want to say the short-term side effect profile of something is obscured by an active control arm in vaccine studies, sure, say that, that's fine. And if we had a saline arm, we would have a better understanding of pain and swelling and erythema redness. Sure, I'm willing to concede that. But if you want to say that if we had a control arm of saline, we'd be able to find all these things you're concerned about, like autism, etc. Uh, I'd say, well, you got a power problem there too. So you got two problems. So I don't think you're not going to get too far there. 
Uh, we're working on some paper where we're going to try to come up with a compromise here that's going to make everybody happy about vaccine safety, I think, because I do think that uh, there are many important points that RFK makes, uh, and some of those points is that our system is not terrific at detecting rare safety signals, as evident by VIT and evident by myocarditis. But this particular point, I'm not really persuaded by the saline. Sure, yeah, give everyone a control arm of saline. You can do that. Uh, the problem then becomes you just don't have the power to find those signals. So, okay. I'm going to come back to the vaccines, but I'm going to talk for a minute about a different randomized control trial. So this is the randomized control trial of a drug. You know, let's put these things in context. This is a randomized control trial of Entresto, which is Secubitril Valsartan. 10,000 people would have been randomized to Secubitril Valsartan versus Enalapril. Here the control arm is a new drug, Secubitril, paired with, so that's drug A, paired with Valsartan, which is an old angiotensin receptor blocker, B, tested against drug C, Enalapril. It's not a placebo-controlled study. Actually, there's nobody here getting a placebo. It's A plus B versus C. And actually, it's even worse than that. It has a double drug run-in period. So if the actual trial design that they used is this, 10,000 people, they stop the Acer arb they take, they take an Alipro for 14 days, 1,000 fall off. Then they take Secubitril Valsartan for 28 days, half of it at the half maximal dose of Valsartan, then the other half of it at the maximal dose of Valsartan. P.S. And now it only gets half maximal dose. Another thousand people fall off. Then you get randomized to continue on what you're taking versus switch back. This is a convoluted study design and it led to regulatory approval. No confirmatory study. So for people who say that, oh, only vaccines get away with non-placebo controlled randomized trials. Well, let me tell you that other drug products get away with hell of a lot worse, a hell of a lot worse. I mean, this is just a completely batshit study design. You have half dose in Alipril versus full dose Valsartan. You're adding a new drug that's branded to get you a patent extension. You've got a double drug run-in period of unequal periods of time. The longer you run in, the more you exclude people who are idiosyncratically intolerant to your medication. Then the control arm has to switch therapies. If there's any penalty for switching, it's paid by the control arm only. The intervention arm continues on the therapy and the doses given in this study have nothing to do with the real world doses. This is a literally batshit crazy study that shouldn't be changing practice. This is changing practice. So anyone who thinks that the vaccines, that's where people are getting away with uh, delinquent study design, you need to read more about drugs because they're getting away with very delinquent study design. Finally, if you were to look globally at randomized control trials in cardiology, you will see something like this. This is a paper that Rosa Ahn, who's now at MGH, and I did, where we looked at 46 consecutive drug approvals in cardiology, 141 studies, and we asked how often is a drug versus placebo, 43% of the time drug A versus B, 17% of the time, sometimes it's drug AB versus A versus B, 10% of the time, but is it drug A plus B versus C, and it's only two trials. Side note, the other trial is Bidil, isosorbide, hydralazine which require the confirmatory study by the FDA. Okay, so it's not quite the same. It actually has better evidence, in my opinion, than paradigm. Okay, and very rarely do we have double drug run-in periods of unequal periods of time. That's the only example ever. Okay, so back to the placebo control question. Knowing that not all drugs that receive regulatory approval are truly placebo controlled, knowing that the placebo, a true inert placebo, will give you a better safety profile but may subvert your questions of efficacy, as in the fruquitinib example, we come back. This is a table created by a lawyer. I haven't uh, checked every single data point on this table, but uh, I think the thrust of the table strikes me as generally probably pretty accurate, which is that these randomized control trials of vaccine used a control group that didn't really get salt water. They got a different vaccine or had no control group, uh, in which case they say it's not truly placebo controlled except for the Gardasil example. Um, Look, I'm happy to concede that by having active active placebo in vaccine studies, you're going to mask some of the short-term safety signals. Um, the part that I'll have difficulty conceding is that you would detect rare longer-term safety concerns because I think you'll struggle with the power issue. I have a solution for it. We're going to manuscript. We're going to submit. This is going to solve it all for all of y'all. Okay, but I'm trying to explain, I think, the principles of placebo control. This is a good example where I see this lawyer has extracted, like, what is the placebo? And in FOIA documents, this is the placebo of this vaccine study was two mLs of sucrose, sodium citrate, sodium phosphate, and no greater than X milligrams of polysorbate 80, which is many of the ingredients in the actual vaccine. And so then the argument is that if any of those ingredients caused any sort of local site reaction or anything, that would be obscured. I think that argument is well taken. But can any of these ingredients, given a low dose, really cause long-term sequela? I'm generally skeptical of that claim, but, you know, they take it more seriously, and it's hard to refute it in the absence of a third arm, which is really salt water. 
Okay, the last topic. Now, when might active placebos actually be desirable and good, okay? Can it be flipped on its head? Let's think about SSRIs. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors is a popular class of uh, medication for people who suffer from major depressive episodes or anxiety. And it turns out if you randomize people to Prozac or sugar pill, and there's also lots of games about running here, but if you randomize them to Prozac or sugar pill, what you're really curious about is whether or not the Prozac makes you feel better, okay, than the sugar pill. But one might imagine that when you take a Prozac versus sugar pill, there'll be some side effect of the Prozac that kind of clues you in you might be getting something. You might have a little dry mouth, a little kind of fuzzy feeling. You might feel some sensation that gives you the clue that maybe I'm not on the sugar pill arm, maybe I'm on the Prozac arm. And if you come to believe that the study is intended to make you feel better, if you come to believe that SSRIs are incredibly promising, what might happen is you take the pill, you get a metallic taste, the metallic taste makes you think you're getting something real, then you start to feel better, not because the pill made you feel better, but because the metallic taste reminded you that you might be getting the real thing and so you ought to feel better. So this is called unblinding. You're being unblinded by the side effect of the pill and your sensation of feeling better is not due to the neuroscience of the pill, but rather the power of suggestion, the placebo effect of the metallic taste. Possible. In order to correct for that, the control arm, maybe it shouldn't just be a sugar pill, which would allow this sort of unblinding to happen. Maybe it should be a pill that has a little metallic taste to it. So now both groups get the metallic taste. One gets the SSRI, one doesn't get it, but it's a sugar pill with a little bit of metallic taste on it. Now we both feel like we might be getting something. Well, does the SSRI have a added benefit beyond the suggestion that I'm getting something? Now it's getting quite interesting. Maybe that is the study design we want. And in fact, in this Cochrane review from two decades ago, quote, the reviewers conclude the more conservative estimate from the present analysis, in other words, it, when you look at active placebo control arms and antidepressants, the effect sizes are smaller, found that the differences between antidepressants and active placebos were small. This suggests that unblinding effects may inflate the efficacy of antidepressants in trials using inert placebos. So wow, okay, an inert placebo versus Prozac will help us clarify the safety profile. What's the safety difference of Prozac versus an inert placebo? But it might subvert the efficacy question because the efficacy question is better of Prozac versus active placebo. So actually randomized trials, maybe there's a logic for some trials to have three arms, inert placebo, active placebo, and the actual compound, particularly for short-term subjective endpoints like psychiatric conditions like depression and anxiety. Okay. Wow, this is a whirlwind tour. We have covered examples in oncology, cardiology, vaccine science, and psychiatry. We're understanding the nuances between truly inert compounds and active compounds, the pros and cons of each. It actually does vary. Now, let's do one more thing and step up our game and talk about procedural interventions, shall we? Procedural interventions. Oh boy, where to get started? Um, if you're having heart attacks, stands work really well. They improve survival a great deal. But if you merely get chest tightness when you shovel the driveway or go for a walk at a reproducible distance, you might not be having plaque rupture or myocardial infarction. You might just have a bit of plaque narrowing one or more of the arteries. And this is typically called chronic stable angina. It is a reproducible pain that comes on with exertion. It comes on at a certain amount of distance. It gets better with rest. And if you have chronic stable angina, the role of stenting, reopening that occluded artery is uncertain. This is typically a longer term plaque buildup that happens in chronic stable angina. For many years, people thought that if you put the stent there, you would lower the risk of subsequent heart attack or death. What we learned in 2008 in the Courage study, you did neither of those things. But people still believed, and in the Courage study, when you randomize these people with chronic stable angina and vascular disease to stent or no stent, even though you didn't live longer, you didn't have fewer heart attacks. We did learn that you had less symptoms and there was a symptomatic benefit that lasts between 18 and 20, 36 months and then it went away. Well, was that symptomatic benefit due to the procedure or was it due to the power of suggestion, the placebo effect of the procedure? Because the control arm of courage got pills. They didn't get a procedure. Well, that was the open question. And in the book, Ending Medical Reversal, Adam Seafew and I speculated that it was a placebo effect. Well, we didn't have to wait long. By the end of 20... 18, sorry, 2017, I think December, it actually preprinted and then it came out in January. Um, Orbita came out. Very clever study, very clever. It is a sham control trial of stenting for chronic stable angina with a primary outcome of modified Bruce protocol treadmill testing. 
And to really understand the study, you got to know a few more factoids, and I'm trying to give you these as fast as possible. But the facts you got to know are if you have chronic stable angina, you tend not to do as well on the modified Bruce Protocol treadmill test. You tend not to go as long on that test. Um, if you had a stent placed for chronic stable angina, you would improve your treadmill testing typically by, I think, 90 seconds in the trial called ACME from two decades ago, three decades ago now. Um, this trial took people with single vessel disease, which was clever because if you only have one vessel that's blocked, because there's three coronary vessels, you only have one that's blocked, you take people with single vessel disease and chest tightness that comes on with exertion, as shown in the pictures, and you open up that single lesion, well, then they should feel better, shouldn't they? And they should go further on the treadmill test. And that's what the investigators took advantage of. of. They randomized patients to have the stent place or to wear headphones and have you poked in the groin and they monkey around down there and they don't actually place the stent. So it's stent versus no stent, but in both cases, they tell you they did it and they put you back on the treadmill and stress you again and see how much you can do. And it turns out both groups, at, well, then the other thing to say is about power. If you give people like this an anti-anginal uh, drug, you should improve the time on the treadmill by 45 seconds. The minimally clinically important difference is thought to be in the 40, 45 second ballpark. And they power the study for a 30 second difference in this treadmill test, which is less than the MCID or the minimally clinically important difference. So ergo, the study is overpowered to detect the minimally important difference. And what they found was a null study that stenting did not improve treadmill stress test time. Uh, the absolute difference was 16 seconds. It was not significantly different. Some fools said that they were underpowered, but when you power yourself for something M less than the MCID, it's not an underpowered study, it's overpowered. And as Daryl Francis once said on Twitter, if you think my trial is underpowered, the only thing underpowered is your brain. All right, so putting all of this together, what's the takeaway lesson here? The takeaway lesson here is that people had chest pain with some blockage in the arteries. If you open that blockage, they actually feel better and they perform better on a treadmill. But is that due to the opening of the blockage or the placebo effect of having done the procedure and made them think that you were opening a blockage? And the answer is in Orbital, when you randomize people to doing it or not doing it, but telling them you did it, the effect is in both arms and there's no difference between the two arms, that's meaningful, ergo that it is entirely or mostly a placebo effect. So stenting something is a placebo procedure that improves symptoms, doesn't improve mortality, doesn't improve MI, and should be done away with for chronic stable angina, where it continues to command $10 billion in market share or something of that nature. That's the beauty of Orbita. Now back to our points about placebo. If you want to know the efficacy of the stent, the control arm should be a sham procedure because that isolates the efficacy of the stent from the thought that you had it done. But what about the safety? You're still going to get a groin bleed in both arms. So the safety signal will be harder to detect for that you need an arm of medicine or where you don't do the procedure at all. So the correct control arm of a study, whether it's placebo controlled or sham controlled or active placebo controlled or, pa or immunologically inert placebo controlled, it depends on the specific clinical question. There is no perfect answer. It also depends on the power of the question that actually is true for the vaccines and is true for Orbital. People said it was underpowered, but their brains were underpowered because it was powered for something less than what people thought was minimally important difference. So it should have found the minimally important difference. It didn't. Whatever it's finding is so trivial that you would never pursue it. 16 second difference is trash. Okay, this is a whirlwind tour. This is a lecture on placebos uh, in drugs and vaccine science. Uh, it's uh, not entirely clear. Uh, there is no perfect answer for every situation. It depends. You have to really understand the clinical context. If somebody wants to tell me that having vaccine studies with immunologically active agents obscures short-term safety, I would say, sure. If they say it also obscures the ability to detect things like autism, et cetera, some of these other concerns they have, I would say, uh, mm, the other problem with that is it doesn't have the power to do that, okay? It doesn't just have that power. So even if you gave salt water in the control arm, you wouldn't have the power to see those signals. Uh, if you want, really, in a randomized fashion to see that signal, uh, you would need a much larger study. What you do have is actually very good observational study that have precluded the possibility that those signals existed very, I think, above odds ratios, above certain magnitudes that are quite convincing to me, but that doesn't mean that the signal couldn't exist in an odds ratio below the magnitude that it could be captured by an observational study. So that's where I'm a little sympathetic to that argument. So I will solve it for you, I promise you. 
We are working on a paper. We will solve all of this for you. We will put a nice bow on it, and we will give you a study design where everyone will be satisfied, the most ardent proponents of vaccines, the most ardent skeptic, and my solution is we need to push the FDA to this, a study design where everyone is satisfied. If we don't, I think they're going to have more and more distrust in public health, which did a shit job on COVID and screwed all of that up pretty much, bungled the shit out of that, and so their distrust is well-deserved completely well-deserved. And the COVID vaccine, they bungled that too. So their distrust is very well-deserved. So I'm very sympathetic to that point of view. All right. That's the video on placebo effect. I hope it was uh, covered a lot on drug policy and placebos. If you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below, send it to a friend. Uh, if these videos do better and better on YouTube, then I will make more and more of them. But if they don't do that well, then I'll do all the other million things I've got to do. So it's up to you. You see what you want. All right. Until next time.